thank you, Father. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Oh, glory to God. Single time. It's Jesus forever. It's Jesus forever. It's Jesus forever. Oh, it's Jesus forever. It's Jesus forever. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Is Jesus yesterday? Is Jesus today? Is Jesus forever? Is Jesus yesterday? Is Jesus today? Is Jesus forever? I know God's will for man. I've believed God's message to man. I am in God's intention for man. And is Jesus yesterday? Today and forever. The learning on my mind, the message on my lips, my eternal devotion. Is Jesus yesterday? Is Jesus today? Jesus forever. You know, if we truly believe that that is all God has ever said to man and all God will ever say to man, then really it should be enough for us. <laughs> I, I don't know how to say it. It's, it should just be enough for us. It should just be enough for us. That I am in God's intention for man. That is why Pastor told us which day and he said, you are in the best place you can ever be. You are in the best phase of your life. There is nothing lacking, nothing missing. It's Jesus yesterday, today. Is Jesus forever? Is Jesus yesterday, today? Is Jesus forever?
thank you, Father. It's Jesus forever. Jesus forever. Jesus forever. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Father. I will see everybody. Thank you, I know. Thank you, Henry. Jesus forever. Jesus forever. God has no other thoughts besides this, no other will for man besides this, no other plan, purpose for man besides this. And we are not searching for anyone outside this as well. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, um, part six. Amen. I'm sure we were all here yesterday, so there's no need for recap. Um, We'll just go straight ahead so we can finish this in one hour and continue again tomorrow. Pastor that is making me and he has told me repeatedly, where are you rushing to? There's no way you are rushing to. Normally this would have ended at part seven. I would have said all I need to say. I'll just tell you, pow, this is it. But I am constrained of Christ and of my pastor to go like, if, if I tell you, it's mostly... Everything we have been saying is just part one and two that we have split to this level. <laughs> Everything. But it's all good. Are you understanding? The goal is comprehension, right? Not speed. So let's do this. Part six. Salvation, as we have said, is an overwhelming testimony in the scriptures. Overwhelming. Second Timothy 3. Start from here. Second Timothy chapter three. I'm not yet hearing Bibles turning, so I'll wait. You know you can quote Second Timothy three, verse fifteen to seventeen. I know that is the first thing I see in your exam script but for workers and training, not this membership group. But open Second Timothy three, fifteen. And that from a child that has known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So in part four, we start analyzing what it means by all scripture given by the inspiration of God. In part five, we understood that the understanding or the wisdom to get from the scriptures is salvation. Salvation. So that is the central theme of the Bible. When we say um, you understand the Bible, it's not that I know the Bible, but understanding the Bible is that you can thoroughly explain what salvation is from the Bible. That is wisdom. So, yesterday, this is where we stop and we'll continue from there. That salvation is a fundamental part of who God is to the extent that the wrong knowledge of salvation affects your knowledge of God. Salvation is fundamental to God that once you get it wrong on salvation, you will definitely get it wrong in your knowledge of God. So we are going to be examining why that is so. Why is it so intricate or integral to God's person that mixing or missing one part equals missing the other part? Okay, so we'll start from there. Salvation um, in the Hebrew, because of course we are going to be examining the Old Testament portion, is um, Yeshua. Deliverance, it means deliverance, aid, victory. Deliverance, aid, victory. Um, so salvation for man would be to save or to deliver him. And man, because of the fallen world, time and chance and everything that happens, has several things that he will need 
deliverance from or saving from. However, not all those things are tied to God's person. Please, if, you, if I lose you anywhere, just do your hand like this. I'll recap. That salvation means to save. In the natural sense, it can mean deliverance from physical things. That is also, you see it in scriptures too, salvation, save me from this. You can even marry a wife and say, oh, save me from this woman. She's now a thorn in my flesh. So the fact that you put the word save there does not now mean that it is the salvation we are talking about. So salvation in context or that the scripture speaks about is specific. And that will be to deliver man from his fundamental problem that plagues him. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. Only one Bible has opened. Okay, oh wait. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3. Verse 15, and I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So that enmity there, that separation is actually salvation. It doesn't look like it because you do not see salvation written there. But that is what it is. That because of man's choice, there was now a union with Satan. What caused the union between man and the devil was hatred for the truth. I'm sure we'll analyze that later in detail. But there was now a union, a union that brought about death, spiritual death, because as at when God was speaking here, man had not died physically. So he was talking about deliverance from that union, salvation from that union. And from the very beginning, we have seen that God puts that portfolio in his own ledger. As he puts that duty in his own portfolio by saying he will do it. So the salvation we are going to be examining will be to save man, deliver man, and all give man victory over sin and the resultant effect of death. That's what we are going to be looking at this morning. That is what God said is is duty. Um, are we ready to open the scriptures? All right, let's start. Psalm chapter 3. Psalm 3. We'll just be examining several scriptures. Of course, not exhaustive in any way, but enough to lay the foundation for what we are saying. Psalm 3, verse 8. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord, thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation is for the Lord. Salvation belongs to to the Lord, and then the blessing that comes from that um, activity is for the people. Let's see Psalm 68 before we continue examining all this. Psalm chapter 68. If you have other translations, please help me get them ready for this. Psalm 68. Psalm, 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 Psalm 68. Verse 18. Draw nigh, oh sorry, 68. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. So you understand that this is talking about 
the resurrection of Christ and the things that accrue from it. But see verse 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily loaded us with benefit, even the God of our salvation. Selah. He that is our God is the God of salvation. And unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. He that is our God is the God of salvation. You cannot separate it. This God, our God, is the God, the, the Lord of our salvation, the bringer of salvation, the owner of salvation. Psalm 3 already told you that salvation belongs to the God, to God. And it now says, unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. What would that mean? Issues from death. Is it benefits from death or the things that come from death? Uh, so issues there means escape. It means the border. You know when you say border? This is our border. You draw the line. Or the exit. Or also deliverance. That has many of issues. So the sin escape from death can only be done by God. God is the only one who can draw the border of death and say, thus far can you pass? You don't have control beyond this place. Do you understand? Okay, so who has other translations so that you'll be able to explain it better? All right, read yours. No, just 20. Our God is the God of salvation. And to God, be the Lord, belong the escape from death. Okay, that one calls issues, escape. Who has another thing? Okay, who delivers from? Verse 20. Which transition is that one? Huh? Yes. <laughs> okay. Our uh, God is God who delivers. Any other one who says that? Who says, um, okay. Okay. Seven Lord rescues us from death. So it is when you say unto God comes the issues from death, it means the deliverance from death, salvation from death. So this is what salvation is about. The rescue from death. And it says it is God's own. Only God can do this. Only God can make a way of escape from death. Death that has held man in his clutches. Only God can set the borderline. Only God can deliver this man from death. Do you understand? Yes. Okay, so now let's start seeing through the scriptures how this was said. Psalm 20. Psalm chapter 20. Psalm 20 from verse 1. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy bond offerings. Grant thee according to thy own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. So this is an eulogy or a praise to God as the God who can save man, deliver him from death. You see it there, I say, by my right hand. Right hand does not mean your right, this right hand, but simply talking about authority, a symbol of strength. By God's display of strength, salvation will be made possible. Not by any other means. Not chariots, not horses, not other things, but strictly that salvation belongs to God. And man is to rejoice in that salvation. Psalm chapter 37. Psalm 37. 37, 37, 37. Right? Quickly and open. Psalm 37, verse 39. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked 
and save them because they trust in him. So clearly there, salvation is God's portfolio. God is the one who can save the righteous. For the man who is righteous, that is the doing of God. Exclusive. Exclusively. Doing of God. Psalm chapter 78. Psalm 78, 78, 78. Please open. We have so many scriptures to cover. Psalm 78. Verse 8. Uh, okay, verse... Sorry, Psalm 79. Verse 8. I'm so used to Psalm 78. Psalm 79, verse 8. Oh, remember not against us for my iniquities. Let thy tender mercy speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of thy name, and deliver us, and purge away our sins, for thy name's sake. Now, you must be intelligent to understand what he's talking about. Because sometimes, it will look like they're talking about physical deliverance. But in the context, or when you examine each word, you realize that they will still go back to that fundamental problem man has, which is sin and death. So here is clearly stated here that the salvation, the deliverance from sins, the ability to purge away sins is what only God can do. And what has brought them very low? Sin. Man who is the crown of God's creation, it was sin that brought man very low. Are you following? We oh, are just so busy writing. Please be thinking through as you're writing and opening. I'm sure your mind is there. So Isaiah, let's leave Psalm. A lot of scriptures in Psalm, but let's leave it first. Isaiah 46. Isaiah. What we are examining is why does salvation, a misunderstanding of salvation, Affect the knowledge of God. Why? Isaiah 46. Verse 13. I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off. And my salvation shall not tarry. And I will give salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. So clearly stated there that it is God that God himself will bring righteousness. God himself will bring salvation. God himself will make it happen. This was Isaiah 46, 13. Action of salvation was tied to God. Signifying what he would do by himself, not anyone else. Salvation was tied to God. Isaiah 51, Isaiah 51, from verse 1, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence you were hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence you were digged. That is, look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. And he will make a wilderness like Eden and a desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Does this look like physical deliverance? Does it look like physical deliverance here? Ah, it seems waste places, wilderness like Eden. It's looking like physical deliverance. Okay, verse 4. Hacking unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation. For a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and my arms shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arms shall they trust. 
Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look unto the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye reviled, afraid of their revilings. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Art thou not eat that had caught Rahab? That Rahab there talks about storm. And wounded the dragon. Talks about a, like a mighty sea monster. So you see what he's talking about in verse 10. Are thou not eat which had dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that had made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? So what was he referring to? The Red Sea and their deliverance from... Okay, 11. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. So this was just using the physical deliverance of the past to assure them of God's salvation. It was speaking concerning God's salvation. How it will be from everlasting to everlasting, from generation to generation. It now refers them to the physical things that happen. Abraham, Sarah, deliverance from, from Egypt in Exodus. So, you see beyond all this and you see salvation. You don't just see parting of the Red Sea. You see the God that is able to ensure his people are saved, no matter the opposition in, in their way. The God that will ensure that man has deliverance from sin and death, no matter how daunting it looks. That is what man is to see. Okay, Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56. All these actions here have been tied to God, 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 God. Isaiah 56. Verse 1. Thus said the Lord, keep it judgment and do justice. For my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. So, still tying it to God again. God's salvation, God's righteousness is what is to come. God's salvation is what will be made known. That's Isaiah 56 verse 1. It's God's righteousness that will be made known. Okay. Verse Isaiah 59. Let's just, how time flies. Isaiah 59, verse 16. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. If you see, if you start reading from earlier verses, you will see that it was talking about the state of man. That man on his own is incapable of bringing salvation. Man cannot. Trans, they, have, they, are not, they themselves are not righteous. They are all, they've transgressed, filled with lines and several other things. So since there was no one else, he himself was going to bring it to pass. His arm brought salvation by himself, his strength. So, prophets kept speaking about this salvation that God will bring, um, that man is incapable, not that man will not desire to, but man is incapable of bringing it to pass. Strictly God. Let's see Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Don't 
persons, if not for teachings in church, they will not open these portions of their Bible at all. You know, it will be there. Just Ephesians, Colossians, those are the ones that Philippians, they just go there, Timothy, Titus, ah, sweet things. We suffer it together. Amen. Oh yeah, let us open. Isaiah 45. Verse 16. Therefore, 5, 16. They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed nor confounded, world without end. Verse 7, 18. And thus said the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he had established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. So it's like a conversation or a demand. Other nations, we have gone after idols. By doing this, you are displaying your ignorance. That's because you are going to seek from of salvation for those who cannot save. Why? Verse 21, tell he and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who had declared this from ancient time? Who had told it from that time? I have not I the Lord, and there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come. And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. So that is clear. There is no other person with the capability to save besides God. It was an absolute statement. He says, go and gather. Search far and wide. Bring anyone you think has the promise or the potential. And you will realize that salvation cannot come from any other source besides me. Absolute. Jeremiah, chapter 3. Jeremiah 3. Where don't Okay, there's no male or female in Christ. So I can call all of you Ma. I can call all of you Sars. Anyone take it. Amen. So, so well done, Mars. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's Bible study. Let's let's do this. Uh, Jeremiah 3, 23. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is salvation of Israel. I'll read that again. Truly in vain. Vain there talks about lies, deception, falsehood. That's Shekar, S-H-E-Q-E-R, I believe that. Disappointment. That anybody who expect salvation or hope from, for salvation from any other source will be disappointed. It now says, truly, that is now the other, uh, emphasizing the contrast, because he has said falsehood is in salvation from other source, but now, but indeed, verily, verily, that is what you can understand. Truly, is salvation that of God, salvation, is in the Lord our God. Lord our God is salvation, is deliverance. 
Jonah chapter 2. Attempting to get salvation anywhere else is just a journey in disappointment. You have been told from the beginning that that journey is going to lead in disappointment. Sorry. Ah, my own Jonah has disappeared. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I found it. Jonah chapter 2. So people are still flipping, so I was not the only one. But me open Jonah. Open. I wait for you to find Jonah. Oh yeah, we find it, find, find, find. Henry, open Jonah. Jonah 2. <laughs> ah. This. After Obadiah, in case you don't know where Obadiah is. <laughs> Be careful. I'm still waiting. So, persons have not found it yet. Uh, how did we. Match, uh, there's a way we knew that in that. Um, yeah, I want to try to count from close to Jonah. I'm trying to remember which one. Which, as Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Oh, yeah. Have you got it now? <laughs> Have you found it? Epa, find it, she. Uh -uh. <laughs> yeah, just balance there. Your neighbor has not found Jonah. Amen. Amen. Children of God, will you shout hallelujah? So I was telling Bumi Richard that that's just a lie. Shout hallelujah to the Lord forever. Uh, but they will still stop you. Uh, so is that not a lie? <laughs> Your spirit shouts hallelujah forever. But no. You have found it, right? Okay, Jonah 2. Jonah chapter 2, verse 8. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Now see what he said in verse 8. He said, they that observe lying vanities. You know, he had already told you that salvation in any other source is vain. It's a disappointment. So those who are seeking these, those who are still going to try to hold on to all those things that the Bible has already called vanity, they are turning their back on God's mercy. That action is them forsaking their mercy. But he now said he will stick to the Lord because salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. God's path is salvation. God's path, B-A-T-H, God's road is salvation. Any other thing outside is a lying vanity. So, this is just to show that salvation can only be gotten from God. Ezekiel. Let's go back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36. Ah, open veteran. We are halfway there, but we get there. Ezekiel 36. Well, before we get to 36, 34, let's just read 34 first. Ezekiel 34. Verse 31. Okay. Uh, okay, let me read from 29. And I will raise up for them a plant of renown, and they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither be the shame of the heathen anymore. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, said the Lord God. And ye, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. So you will see physical things. Yeah, now it was sheep and flock that was used to describe what God will do. When you see all this Israel, 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 this is what we talked about, the multitude of integration. We saw yesterday that God's plan is actually for all men. But the reason why, you, why it was looking like it was hidden was because the comparison you will see about salvation or the saints, it was always depicted by Israel. Israel. But of course, 
We saw yesterday that it was for all men. So we see physical things here. Sheep, flock, shepherd used to explain what God would do, that it is his own duty, which is salvation. So he would deliver them from, uh, and they will not be consumed with the things that plague them. That's what he said in verse 29. What is consuming them, the things that plague them, will no longer plague them. So that deliverance can only come from God. Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. Now this will just this will clearly show how even though they were it seemed like they were talking about physical things, but it was obviously referring to salvation. Ezekiel 36, are you there? Verse 24. For I will take you from among the hidden and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Does that look like physical deliverance? Yes. But see verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgment and do them. So is that spiritual now? But see verse 28. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the hidden. Then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abomination. And he's saying that he's doing it for his own name's sake. So, what was he talking about? Salvation. Salvation. Using physical evidence to explain that they will be delivered from sin, iniquity, uncleanliness. He will put his spirit in man. Clearly salvation. And all in God's portfolio. I will. I will. I will. This is what I will do. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel 37, 22. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more true nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. So this is now looking like he was talking about the uniting of Judah and Israel together to become one nation. Verse 23, neither, did I lose you anywhere? I, Ezekiel 37, the next chapter, verse 23 now, neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them, and so shall they be my people, and I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgment, and observe my statutes, and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children, forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever." So if this is not talking about a physical David, that David will be resurrected to become their king, then it's also absurd to think that this was talking about a physical land that they would dwell in forever. Do you understand? So all these are symbols or uh, um, examples, events that they can understand to be able to know that God was talking about salvation. And 26 says, moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it will be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. 
My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. So God is saying that he will do something lasting, and his dwelling place will be in man. Man will be his dwelling place forever. Because of what he has done. And this he will do all by himself. All by himself. Zephaniah. <laughs> Zephaniah. Is it your Bible? Open. Sorry, you are already in Ezekiel. Don't go back. Just be going forward. You will find it. Zephaniah. Are we there? Zephaniah. Zephaniah. Agai, Zachariah, Malachi. So, this one is not hard. In your Lua, the bishop of our generation. Wait, <laughs> don't Okay, Zephaniah 3. Zephaniah 3. Verse 13. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, with all the heart as your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord had taken away thy judgment. He had cast out thy enemy, the king of Israel. Even the Lord is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil anymore. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thy hands be slack. The Lord thy God is in the midst, in the midst of thee. He is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. You, he will joy over thee with singing. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time, I will undo all that afflicts thee, and I will save her that altered, and gather her that was driven out, and I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, said the Lord. Absolute awesome words, all speaking about salvation. All speaking about salvation. And he said the Lord in the midst of thee is mighty. Talking about God's ability. He does not lack the ability. See the words you use. I will make, I will save, I will gather. So, God's strength in salvation was to be their comfort. His ability, that mighty strength to be displayed in salvation was to bring comfort to them, assurance to them. That was their mighty. Talks about strength, mighty strength, champion. So confidence is tied to who was doing it. The confidence in salvation was tied to who was doing it. We have been saying, I will do, and you will do, and you will rejoice, and you will have rest, and you will rejoice in this, and you'll be glad, and the blessings will be upon you. The confidence of that is tied to who was making it happen. Zachariah. Zachariah. Zachariah chapter 8. Zachariah 8, verse 7. Thus said the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. You see there in the epistles, I will be my people, there will be my people, and I'll be their God. Talks about that talks about salvation that makes us 
members of God's household. So when you see they will be my people, I will be their God. Meaning right now, they were not his people. Being, having God's name is tied to what he will do in salvation. So, that seems like Isaiah 8, verse 18. Verse 13. And it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the hidden, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, let your hands be strong. So, they were to gain confidence because of the fact that God says, I will. You will see that, fear not, relax. I'm the one doing it. Trust in this. Trust in this. Multitude of assurance for men to bask in, in what God has done. Zechariah 9. Okay. Yeah. Getting closer to the permanent side. Zechariah 9, verse 16. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon his hand. For how great is his goodness, and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful, and new wine the maids. Come there, talks about increase. So he's saying that this is what God will do, verse 16. God will save them. And then, because of they are using what God is doing as a measure of his goodness and his greatness. Can you see there? Are you sure? See verse 16. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as a sign upon his, upon his land. For how great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. So what God will do in saving his people is a display of his goodness and his beauty. And the rest cheerfulness of those of the people there was tied to what God will do. It was as though God was taking their, as in he was placing their happiness. When you are saying your happiness, your joy, your comfort is dependent on what I will do. So because of that, don't worry. I will definitely do it by myself. Because if it fails, your own joy, cheerfulness, increase, everything also fails. Zachariah 10. 6 to 7. I will strengthen the house of Judah, I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them again to place them, for I have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off, for I am the Lord their God, and will hear them. And they of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their hearts shall rejoice as through wine. Yea, their children shall see it and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. He said they will be rejoicing as though they drank Shekbeh. Ah, that thing people did after we left. Waited to do. I saw the picture this morning. That people did for happy when we left. I'm suspecting it. Don't worry. When you leave, go and check the group. Because when you're asking for permission, whatever you're asking Jema for permission to do, you did it when we left. For you to not be saying soft there, I will check me. I shall inquire dutifully after the service. Okay. So, there are thoughts, happiness, and everything was tied to what God will do, and men will reap the benefit. What God will do, we guarantee the participants rejoicing. It will guarantee it. Anybody who hears it will rejoice. We rejoice. That's why rejoicing is not a difficult thing for the believer. As Pastor Jola said, you should not hear, I'm a son of God, three times, and at least not rejoice. Then something is, you should check your sonship. All right.
right? So we have seen that salvation is an overwhelming testimony in the scriptures. Why, do you, why is it, what, let me explain this statement to you. Why is it so? Because this is the only thing that all the prophets agreed on. Remember yesterday when we said you don't interpret the scriptures disjointedly, that they have the same thought pattern no matter who is writing. And how did they arrive at that? It means from Genesis, they were tracing. What did this person say that is tied to this person, that is tied to the same thing, the same thing, the same thing? And the conclusion was salvation. All of them spoke about it. The only thing all the prophets agreed on is was what they spoke irrespective of dispensation. Before the wars, if you say they were talking about deliverance from Egypt or whatever enemies that plagued them, before those deliverance was needed, after those deliverance was, need, uh, was done, even before man, same thing being said. Salvation. They all agreed on it. The man's need for salvation and the fact that it will be brought by God's hand alone. This is why we say salvation is an overwhelming testimony in the scriptures. And we just did a partial glance. This is not even up to 10% of what the scriptures already spoke about salvation. But just to give you an understanding. So God takes his integrity on this. God takes his his character on this. Because we have been seeing the mighty assurance given tied to salvation. He would do something permanent, lasting, forever, and men will rejoice because of that. Men will be at rest because of that. God is taking his, everything he has on it. Okay, let me use it. For example, we say we, man, men just left Stone Age. Let's assume that Stone Age, or that's what they call it. There was an era where men did not have clothes. Or because of the harsh condition in life, all the clothes, any cloth man wears will definitely just tear off after one day. No matter how fine it is, it just withers. Then, we now have the anointed tailor of the generation. We have the, the one in whom the fullness of wisdom concerning clothes resting, Henry. And he comes and says, see, glory to God. And he says, don't worry. This affliction plaguing all of you that your clothes are not lasting. I will make cloth for you. That cloth I will make. You will wear that cloth. Nothing can ever happen. The cloth will fully cover. You don't need to wash it. It will not tear no matter what, you just, just, just that cloth, just wear it. Your nakedness is eternally covered. Now, if Aaron now makes a cloth and brings it and you take it, if anything happens to that cloth, whose character is affected? Whose integrity is at stake? Because for him to boldly say such things, he said, hey, I would use all that I, is it all the skill, everything I know to ensure that this one cannot fail. So if it fails, ah, it means that he is a, is, is not as anointed as he thought he was. He's not as mighty as he was. So God has been talking about salvation and he's saying that, hey, I will do this one. It will be so sure so permanent, so long-lasting, so everlasting, that nothing man does will alter it. If you now get the knowledge of that thing that he said he will do wrong, what has it affected? God's character, God's integrity. That is why we are saying that salvation is so tied to God that once you get it wrong on salvation, you have missed it in the knowledge of God. It's not a two-way thing. That is how God has made it. Because of how intricate it is to him. God is the originator of salvation. So whether you, it's not intentional. The fact that you say, ah, I did not want, it's not like I was trying to say God is bad or God is evil. No, by misinterpreting salvation, you have said so. That is why we used all this as the clear checkmate, the safety check on God's character, on the knowledge of God. Say, ah, Christ, scripture, salvation. If you miss it on anyone, the knowledge of God cannot be accurate. That 
that is why. It's because of how God has taken his name to this. It's why he did not allow salvation to be done by any, any person. Let's see some few scriptures and then we'll close it. 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter 1, verse 8. We have reached your side now. I expect that you open your Bible quickly. First Peter 1, 8. Whom, having not seen, you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now, in verse 10, what did he say the prophets spoke about? Yes. Which of that word again? Salvation. Now, in verse 11, which word shows that salvation? Pius, did you get it? The service of God and the glory that should follow. So it is intricately tied to God, which means that this is what Christ came to do. This salvation, another way you can call it, is the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Salvation is not what God left to any man. Because of how his own name is tied to it, you see that even from the beginning, it has been said, the person who will carry this thing out was also said. So let's quickly look at these scriptures so that we'll close in five minutes. Are you ready? Um, Genesis 49. Genesis, 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 Genesis. Genesis 49, verse 9. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So, Shiloh here will refer to who? Israel, you get it? Shiloh here, Christ. Because Christ came from Judah. And he's saying that kingship would be there as David. Until the line of David will continue to be kings. Until Shiloh comes. Until Christ comes. And that Christ that comes, that Shiloh, the embodiment of all God will give to man. And it says, unto him shall the people gather. Unto Christ. Daniel 2. Daniel chapter 2. Please open. We have to see this together. Daniel 2. Verse 44. And in the days of these kings, Daniel 2.44. Daniel, 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 Daniel 2.44. And in the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. He was talking about different kings that will come up and have authority. He now says that God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all those kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. That God is going to do something, set up an authority, a dominion, that will not be left to other persons to do. Other persons will not have power over it. Whether in bringing it to pass, in affecting it, no. It is not a kingdom that will have control 
from anywhere else. This is sovereignty. We'll come back here later. Psalm 2 or Zachariah. Since we're already in Daniel, let's just go to Zachariah. Zachariah. Zachariah, chapter 6, verse 12. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of all, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. He shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. They were trying to gather money and resources to build the physical temple. And utterance was coming that, hey, someone is coming who you can call the branch. We have seen other scriptures refer to him as a branch of righteousness. Uh, we'll, maybe we'll look at them later if we have time. And he's saying that this is the person who will build the temple. Definitely, it wasn't talking about the physical temple. So, he will build the temple of the Lord. Where God will stay, this is the person who will do it. Let's see Psalm 2. Psalm chapter 2. Verse 1, why do the hidden rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that seated in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So this speaks of who? Please look at your Bible. Then verse speaks of Christ. Verse 8, Ask of me and I shall give thee the hidden for thy inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. This is where people got your instructed sir, from. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and perish, and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled by the little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. This was using strong words to show the absolute jurisdiction that Christ will ex exercise. He said, ah, Christ will do something. Persons will think they can undo. But it will just... God will just, he said, he that sits in heaven shall laugh. And men's attempt to either try to do what him, only him can do, or to undo what he has done. Someone, are you fine? Because you have not been writing, you've just been looking at my face. I might have preached this morning. Okay, so, it has to kiss the son, lest he be angry. That means your justification, what you will get is all tied to the son. So, Hey, ensure you are, uh, this is not psycho fancy. Just ensure that, uh, you know when everything you need is tied to one person. Like I said, all my wealth, like there's something in my house that is bequeathed to Henry now. It is his. So, I said, all my wealth is tied to Henry. Hey, anything you want, go and meet him. Oh. How should you approach Henry? Ah, Henry. <laughs> my brother, <laughs> just, uh, you are the, uh, only you now you. Because you know what you are going to get. So that is what he was just trying to explain. Kiss his son, lest he be angry. Not that Jesus will be exercising uh, uh, a tyrannical dominion, but because of everything from God is tied to this man, hey, ensure that you don't disregard him. Okay, Isaiah 53. We know this scripture. I've been reading it long since. Okay, we shall all read this together. Isaiah 53. 53, 53, 53. 53, are we there? All of God's intention will be carried out by the Son. And this is the chapter of the Bible that explicitly talks about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. Explicit. In the judgment of God, the series here, taught by pastors, it was explained verse by verse. Of course, you cannot finish workers in training without knowing Kabura, Kabura, Pesha, uh, shalom, shalom, uh, avon, avon. <laughs> uh, ah, there's another word that is after Kabura Kabura that was really, really serious. Makob, Makob, Makoba. Yes, you can't, at least you can't forget. Okay, so Isaiah 53, I'll read the first verse, then we'll take the second one like that. 
who had believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Verse 2. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Verse 4. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 6. Seven, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before a sharer's is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Eight. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had don't know violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Verse 10. Verse 11. He shall see of the travel of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he had poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressions, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgression. So this is a scripture that just depicts what Christ will do, and the glory that comes after it. It says he poured his soul unto death. So not talking about physical, the other is busy, no. The fact that his soul was made an offering for sin. And he says, because of this, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see of the travel. You see the results, and he will be satisfied. It was worth it. That is the glory. He will see men like this and say, ah, it was worth it. That we are the ones that make the sacrifice of God worth it. Hallelujah. So, this was the mission statement of Jesus. Because if you don't, if you have not gotten anything else, just see, this is Jesus' mission statement. Now you can understand what he said in John. Let's see John. This is the last scripture. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Verse 31. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. It's open. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witness of me is true. He is sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say, that you might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Verse 36, but I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself, which has sent me, had borne witness of me. How was this done? Verse 37. What's the witness of God here? Have you forgotten? What's the witness of God in verse 37? The scriptures. So, now, see 36. He says that the works which the Father had given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me. This was not just talking about the fact that he was healing men. No. Because you've seen in the healing and even the judgment of God that the physical things he did was, first, was further proof of the spiritual thing that he was going to do. So the works that the Father gave him to finish was that Isaiah 53. And all that we have been reading since. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. This is what he is to do. And this is what he said I have finished. Salvation was too integral for God to live in the hands of any man. He himself said, I, do, I will do it myself. And as we've seen, as we have been traced, don't forget, there's no part of the dividing world that is, you can live in isolation. They're all tied together. There's a reason why we are going like this step by step. We have already analyzed that Jesus said, he is what? The intention of God he is the word of God made flesh. And what has that been? We have seen that the intention of God is salvation. So when we say the intention of God made flesh, it means salvation be played out for you. 
how it will happen. Bam! I came to show it. I came to do it. I came to make it available. So, since it is God's salvation, to honor him and to appreciate what he did, we will have to see what he said and what he did as the final authority as touching salvation. We have settled that it is God's salvation and it is not any man's own. God's, strictly. If we say we honor God and appreciate what he did, then what he said concerning salvation and what he did in salvation must be final authority for us. Must be final authority. So, what about Christ that we to know? Christ, the intention of God. Yes, Christ, the revealer of God. But it was specific. That was why we don't see plenty details in the Bible. Some of you, I know you will be wishing there was a physical description of how God was. So that we we'll know whether he was muscular or he was slim or he had long hair or he was black or he was white. You wish there was all those things. And how the fact how his earthly life progressed and the rest. But the scriptures were fixed on what was necessary. The things to know about Christ is the things to know about God, which he came to reveal, which is his sufferings and the glory that should follow. God is focused. He is a God of order. The Bible is not the reservoir of all knowledge. Say anything you are looking for, come and find it here. No. It was focused on what God wanted man to know about him, which is the sufferings of Christ and the glory that we follow. So from tomorrow, we are going to just note these things. This is what we are going to be analyzing in this religion because we are going to explain their understanding of salvation. And all they understand about salvation as they teach it is based on these five tenets. T. T means total depravity. T, total depravity. U, unconditional election. L, limited atonement. I, irresistible grace. And P, perseverance of sins. Where did I lose you? <laughs> They're like tulip. C, total depravity. U, unconditional election. L, limited atonement. I, irresistible grace. Then P, perseverance of the saints. So we are going to start with T tomorrow. Um, just start with T tomorrow. Um, we should hopefully, within two sermons, I've been able to cover it and then move on. So do you understand what we have said today now? Do you understand what was said today? You didn't get it. T U L I P. Tulip. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. So we'll continue tomorrow. There's outreach this evening. Ensure you, um, everyone is at their duty post. Tomorrow by 8 a.m., service continues. Thank you very much. <laughs>